Your two o'clock is waiting in your office. That's the generic white girl fantasy heroine. That's the one. Good afternoon. Hello. Ooh. Ooh. Excuse me. How old is she? Uh, I'm 36. Oh, no, no. I said generic white girl fantasy heroine. You also said we need to branch out from 16 year old waves. I didn't mean to branch two decades out. Whatever, fine. Maybe old people will read it. Sorry about that. So, as a fantasy heroine, we do need to know, can you handle a sword? Uh, yes? What kind? You know, a sword. Giant metal thing, pointy end goes in the other man, weighs about four and a half kilos. You're asking if I can wield a sword which represents about 7.5% of my body weight? Yes. Do I have magic powers? Not currently. Then no. Oh, are you being sarcastic? We love the sarcasm. It's good for the banter with the hot enemy and the childhood best friend who is also naturally hot. I think we're going to do great things together. Hello. Oh, you're hurt. Excellent. Tell me all about it. I wrenched my shoulder in training, which is going to present a little bit of a problem. Because you're going to be stubborn and refuse to let anyone see it until you collapse into the arms of one of your love interests. No, because I'm wearing a male shirt and I can't take it off if I can't raise both of my arms above my head. Your hot childhood best friend is around here somewhere, I'm sure he'll help. Or I could arrange for your hot enemy to help you get unbuckled. You did not like the one that opened at the front. This is all in one piece. I have to touch my toes and do an undignified wiggle dance to take it off. This may require a rewrite. Could you get stabbed instead? You don't mean stabbed through the male shirt, right? I'll think of something. I have no doubt. Good morning. I see you got out of your whore book despite your shoulder injury. Did you learn a new word today? Yes, actually. Great. Yes, I did. Without any help at all. Oh, ow, 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 ow. Yes, without any help. It hurt quite a lot. Ah! I still can't brush my hair properly. What was that? Nothing. Well, when your shoulder is mostly healed, don't like the sign of mostly, you will be required to travel on horseback in the company of my horse enemy. Precisely. And when you reach the first way station in the wilderness, there's only one bed. Correct. Hmm. I sleep on the floor. But there's only one blanket. By the fire. It's summer. I'll probably be fine. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure I'll think of something. So you're staying overnight at a way station with your hot enemy and of course, there's only one bed. Yes, fine. I am taking the floor. That's fine. Really? If you feel that's the right choice, then absolutely. It's just a shame about your nightmares. You killed off my husband before the story even started. My kids are staying with my brother and sister-in-law while I try to resolve the plot. And there's a war on. Of course I have nightmares. You wouldn't. I know what the people want. There's going to be grudgingly affectionate cuddling when I wake up screaming and disorientated, isn't there? And possibly some hair stroking. Like I said, I know what the people want. Good morning. Morning. Today we just need to jump back to before you go on your trip with your hot enemy because you need to pack. Possibly including a knife or ornately decorated dagger, but let's start with the clothes. I mean, obviously I'm going to pack a knife. To threaten your hot enemy in the middle of the night? The knife is for eating, though I suppose I could threaten someone with it if sufficiently motivated. Anyway, what kind of clothes? Well, travelling things. And your most beautiful gown, obviously. Are we attending a formal event at our destination? Naturally. And you aren't going to have all my stuff washed away in a freak rainstorm so that my hot- my- Travelling companion and I have to go shopping? Now that you mention it... I really wish I hadn't. Don't be a spoil sport. Now, how attractive is your nightwear? Ugh. Well, I've finished packing and I'm ready to go. We need to talk about your hair. Oh, do you like it? Now that my shoulder's better, it's much easier to manage proper hairstyles again. Well, it is very tidy and practical, but couldn't you do something a bit sexier? You said we were going to be travelling a lot, so I picked something that I don't need to redo every day. Besides... I think it's pretty. What's with this sudden preoccupation with being pretty? I thought you weren't like other girls. All right, one, I haven't been a girl in nearly two decades now, and two, it is quite stressful trying to prevent my children's inheritance from being stolen out from underneath them, so I will take my joy where I can get it, and that includes having marginally nicer hair than usual. Fine. Couldn't you put it up in some way that it will fall down dramatically in the middle of a fight scene, or possibly when you're having a really involved argument with your hot enemy? It's really more likely to just fall down at random rather than at appropriate dramatic moments. Besides, you really need to stop calling him that. He's not my enemy and he has a name, I think. I am touched by your concern for him, Rosamond. Please don't get any ideas.
Your first two days on the road are uneventful. Good. There are several Lord's Estates en route and they are happy to house you and your hot and your travelling companion in separate rooms to show off their immense wealth. Wonderful. Which means you are at least moderately well rested when four bandits of unknown origin attack you on the third day. What? You take the first bandit by surprise with your concealed sword and kill him almost instantly, but you are incapacitated by the second and require assistance. Your companion has killed the third bandit and pulls the second bandit off you, incidentally saving your life, but he is attacked from behind by the fourth bandit, injured and knocked to the ground. At which point... Leo, stay down! You throw a dagger the existence of which has only been hinted at to this point, hitting the fourth bandit in the throat and saving the life of... Leo, was it? I did tell you he had a name. He's probably not going to be thrilled that I neglected to mention the dagger. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of time for you to have a meaningful conversation while you patch him up. Oh. Goody. Evening. Ready to patch up and covertly ogle your hot shirtless enemy? Leo, was it? I'm ready to patch up Captain Collins, probably while enduring a lecture about bringing a weapon he didn't know about, even if I did use that weapon to save his life when we were attacked by bandits. Yes, you probably should have told him before you left, specifically when he asked you what weapons you were bringing. I don't think you can blame me for questioning whether anyone disposable enough to send on this mission with me would be competent or trustworthy. I think we can assume that he's well aware you don't trust him. Look, I understand why he might not like it or why he might be suspicious of me now, but we're stuck together regardless, so whether he trusts me or hates me, I don't care, as long as we get where we're going. This may require a dual point of view chapter. It has come to my attention that in the medieval period it was typical to go to an inn and pay for a space in a bed rather than a whole room. Mm -hmm. And so it's entirely justifiable on the nights you're staying in more modest accommodation that you should be expecting to share a bed with your hot enemy, with Captain Collins. Caroline. I mean, you denied he was your enemy, but you never denied that he was hot. You do recall that your haphazardly constructed world isn't actually representative of any particular historical period. <laughs> and that fact aside, you don't think I might be justifiably wary of him? Well, look did save my life, and that buys him a lot of goodwill, but I'm pretty sure he's still angry about the fact that I didn't trust him, and I don't sleep easily next to demonstrably dangerous men who are unhappy with me. But Caroline, please, stop pushing this. Fine, I will leave it be. At least until the Wilderness Way Station. Evening. Are you all right? Cannot believe I fell into the river. It's a good job I can swim. And didn't Leo, I mean Captain Collins, pull you to safety? He did, and now my shoulder's twinging and he is bleeding again. I hope you're happy. And look, you were soaked through and had to wash your hair and change all your clothes. Yes, that, that did happen. And isn't that his- Yes it is, but we're not talking about that right now. If you say so. I'm just glad it's summer. But it is unusually chilly, and so you're going to sit by the fire and the awkwardness of the last few days is going to abate slightly while you patch him up again and he brushes and braids your hair in a manner that is adorable, but also somewhat haphazard. Can I at least sleep in for a bit tomorrow? But of course. That way he can reluctantly notice you're pretty while you're still asleep. What was that? Nothing. I am so glad we're finally here. This trip has been a nightmare. I wouldn't say that. We were attacked by bandits. I killed two people. We almost died. And you did an excellent job at patching up the captain's non-specific injuries. And if that weren't bad enough, two days later I fall in a river and he unpatches himself, hauling me out again. So chivalrous. I was soaked to the skin. I had to change all my clothes and my shoulder meant I couldn't sort out my own wet hair, so he had to do it for me. Very romantic. And your shoulder was fine by the morning. Because, of course, that was also the night we were near the border and accommodated was basically a shepherd's hut with a box of hay instead of a bed. You could have shared. We've been through this. No. You could have got into an argument over who got to- He's still injured and I was freezing. Better to be in my bedroll by the fire anyway. Such a shame about your subsequent nightmare. We're not even touching the nightmare. But wasn't it a wonderful bonding, trust-provoking experience with your hot set with, with Leo? I mean, he made me a cup of tea and didn't make me feel bad for getting snot on him. Ugh. But still, bonding. Can we please get back to the plot? Fine. Rosamond, you will never guess what. You finally decided to name the city we just travelled to? Much better than that. We're famous on the internet. Oh, the internet is- Caroline, I literally live in your head. I know what the internet is. Although, I must say, they do all think you're going to stab me. Can't say I haven't been tempted. But they're also invested, which I think is what the kids say when they like things. Well, I'm happy for you. Also, at least half of them seem to get your name wrong. I'm sure they'll pick it up. Well. Since we're now internet famous, I think we should continue planning out what happens once you arrive in... Yes? Kieferth, where you are to deliver Queen Eudocia's declaration of truce to King Roland. And I assume that King Roland is going to declare a ball to celebrate. And it's a masquerade too. Of course it is. 
In the two days between crossing the border and arriving at your destination, Leo leaves the talking to you. I mean, I assume he speaks the language, but I don't think he's comfortable. Now, having successfully arrived at said destination, he for it? Working on it, you immediately tidy yourselves up and go to present the declaration of truce to King Roland, which goes without a hitch. Really? Really. King Roland is well aware that the death of his father was a convenient excuse for both sides to back away from the war, and greets Queen Eudocia's declaration of truce and proposed peace talks with what seems to be genuinely positive feeling. Wonderful. He even declares a masquerade ball to celebrate, which will take place in four days' time. Is that really historically? I was informed that my haphazardly constructed world isn't actually representative of any particular historical period, so if I want a masquerade ball, Rosamond, then a masquerade ball I shall have. You remember that my estate is hosting the peace talks and I'm on a deadline to get back to prepare? Yes, I remember. Now let's talk dresses. We have several dress options for the masquerade ball in your home country, and I'm thinking that your masquerade costume would make excellent cover art. I only actually brought one ball-appropriate dress, and shouldn't you finish writing the book first? It's important to think ahead. Now, if the words acres of leg and or bosom are about to cross your lips, I should warn you. Don't be silly. You don't even have acres of bosom. Yes, I am aware. I just wasn't sure if the cover artist was. Don't worry about it. Can you just pick something pretty but relatively practical? No weird cutouts, no thigh-high slits, just a nice formal dress that covers all my stretch marks and allows me to stash a large number of small weapons. Please? I think I have just the thing. Your cooperation fills me with terror. Really, you astonish me. Because it means that there's something worse coming that you haven't told me about yet. In the days preceding the masquerade, the king's wife, Queen Catherine, my little sister, invites you to tea every day. Captain Collins is also invited, but attends only once. Yes, it was awkward watching him nod politely for three hours while Kat and I talked about babies. A bit, yes, but mostly boys. Interesting things our mutual acquaintances have done since the last time we met. Whatever. You're enjoying your time with your sister and baby niece on the afternoon of the ball when an assassin crashes through the window, weapons drawn. Cat, go! Your sister takes the baby and runs for the door. You are forced to use the weapons at hand, and so throw the knife and cheese board at the assassin before diving to your sister's bed and retrieving her sword. Don't move. The assassin was not expecting resistance and flings a knife at you which embeds itself uselessly in the door as he makes his escape out the window. I've seen that knife before. Having just foiled an assassination attempt on your sister, Queen Catherine, you return to your rooms, your mind whirling. Caroline, I'm not seeing things, am I? That knife was my husband's. How mysterious. Nevertheless, the king insists that the ball must go ahead, though your sister will not be in attendance. Good. One less person to worry about keeping alive. Shortly thereafter, your hot in Captain Collins knocks on your door. Someone just tried to kill my sister. He smashed right through the window, even though we were several stories up and you'd think someone would have spotted him climbing. Oh, picky picky. Leo. Something is very wrong here. You had better get ready for the ball. I guess it's time to find out exactly how many weapons I can hide in that dress. Ready for the masquerade, Rosamond? I'm almost done. Time's a-wasting. It's fine. I'm, I'm ready. I'm just... It's difficult to stash a lot of weapons while still making them easy to access. Oh, you look beautiful. Thank you. Though, it would probably be more of a compliment if we didn't have exactly the same face. This is a strong contender for the cover art. Possibly the scene where... Where? Oh, you'll find out. Oh, good. Come in. Whoever could that be? Good evening, Captain. So you're not going to be surprised that the mysterious stranger you feel like you've known for years is actually Leo, then? No. Oh. Shall we? Oh, I'm so excited! Captain Collins sticks unusually close to you as you enter the masquerade. Well, like I said, I don't think he's particularly keen on the language. And you're escorted to the dais to greet the king, who is tall and imposing in a black cloak and helmet. Your Majesty. You don't initially participate in the dancing, choosing instead to keep an eye on the king, but then you are approached by a mysterious stranger who- Robin! Who you apparently recognize whether or not half his face is covered, but then you have known him since you were seven years old. Your hot childhood best friend requests the next dance. Captain Collins, some distance away, looks perturbed. He doesn't need to worry, I'm still going to keep an eye on the king while I'm dancing. Yes, that's definitely what he's concerned about. When did you get here? Quite recently. Queen Eudocia sent him two days after your departure in case you didn't arrive. We nearly didn't. Captain Collins had to fish me out of the river, among other delights. He glances over at Captain Collins. Oh, <laughs> have you met? Yes, when he visited Baron Mabry's estates, Captain Collins is, or was, an officer in his militia. Oh no. You abandon your hot childhood best friend mid-dance and go and speak to the king? I fear you're in grave danger, your majesty. Wait, what? Roland, what do you know about Baron Mabry? Fine. Even though it is a highly inappropriate time to ask, you are his sister-in-law and you did just save his wife's life, so he tells you what he knows, including his suspicions about the circumstances of your husband's death. I think I'm going to be sick. 
I tell him what I know. Rosamond, my escort Captain Collins used to work for the Baron and may still. I don't think if he knows about the peace talks. I need to get home now. Rosamond, what is wrong with you? You're supposed to be dancing with Captain Collins. I queued up my waltzing with your hot enemy playlist and everything. What are you doing? I'm going home. Yes, you said, but why? Because I think I understand now. Well, I don't. None of this is in the outline. Rosamond, please stop running out on my masquerade ball. Caroline King Rowland suspects Baron Mabry of arranging my husband's murder in an attempt to keep the war going. And presumably also to steal his land. Yes. And when Hugo's body was returned to us, his knife wasn't among his effects. Following you so far. So is it merely the veriest coincidence that Captain Leo Collins, formerly of Baron Mabry's militia, wait, is here when an assassin tries to kill my sister using my dead husband's knife, presumably in an attempt to implicate me? Rosamond, or might it be reasonable to suspect that Leo Collins is a traitor to the realm who only saved my life so he could use me later? Is that why you're stealing his horse? If the Baron already knows about the peace talks, everyone under my roof is in danger. I might already be too late. And I had such a beautiful evening planned. Candlelight, dancing, flirtatious threats. And what do I get? Grand Theft Equine. It's a few hours after sunrise and you're on the road, heading home in a hurry, with your own horse plus the one you stole from your hot enemy. He's not going to need it? I can't believe you told King Roland he was a spy! I can't believe I didn't realise this before! You even called him my hot enemy! Why didn't I see it? You can't know things in the story until you actually work them out. That's just how it is. Besides, I wasn't anticipating this at all. This wasn't how the masquerade was supposed to go. What, was I supposed to be stupider? Frankly, yes. Not sorry. Wouldn't have expected you to be. It was a great dress, though. It was nice. Yes, that's what Leo said about all of them. Pardon? Never mind. Did you at least bring it with you? Yes, everything else was already packed, so I just shoved it in at the top. I still don't understand why you didn't wait for King Roland to provide an escort. I think I'm safer on my own right now. I was really hoping your bad decisions arc would be more romantically related, but... Here we are. After a few days of reasonably rapid travel, you arrive at the bridge that will take you home. Unfortunately, it will also take you onto Baron Mabry's lands. Very briefly, I'll be on home ground in a few hours. The bridge is heavily guarded. News of the truce has reached the town, but everyone is still being heavily questioned before being allowed to cross, and many people are being turned away. What alternatives are there to the bridge? After a short journey upstream, you consider shooting an arrow across the river with a string attached. Ordinarily, I would ask where the bow came from, but right now I just don't care. My editor would never let it slip anyway, he's a total stickler. I see. Since no other method presents itself, you return to the town, intent on getting a few hours sleep before attempting to sneak across the bridge when it's full dark. Fine. But just as you are crossing the stable yard, a pair of strong arms grab you from behind, a hand is clapped over your mouth and you are dragged into the shadows. It seems your hot enemy and hot childhood best friend have caught up with you. I'm just going to let you explain, because I have barely slept in three days. So in short sentences, please. What do you want? The same thing you do. To inform Queen Eudocia of what you've learned. To make the peace talks happen. For Queen and Country, Rosie. Oh no. And the penny drops. You're a spy. You're both spies and you went to spy on the Baron, not for him. And thanks to you telling King Roland, Robin had to effect daring rescue and both of them need to leave the country in a hurry. Then we all need to go to the same place. Can you help me? Well, since Captain Collins used to work for Baron Mabry, he still knows many of the soldiers. So you can sneak me across? Sneaking is probably not going to work, but it is convenient that you have that white gown in your saddlebag. Excuse me? I think it's time for a good old-fashioned fake wedding. Fine. Caroline, I know how much you want this fake wedding. I feel a butt coming. But I have another idea. Is this a run out of my masquerade without drawing a single knife kind of idea, or one I'll actually like? Robin now knows the grounds on which the Baron is planning to challenge my administration of the Hawkehurst estate. Which are? My marriage contract. Ah. All the couples entered into the arranged marriages with the understanding that they would retain their citizenships and any children would be citizens of both countries in an attempt to maintain peace and goodwill. Well, I suppose you didn't go to war for a good... 15, 16 years? Indeed. But the fact remains, I'm not a citizen, and while under normal circumstances an exception could be made, the fact that we're technically still at war... Ah, he's going to disrupt the peace talks, claim I'm a citizen of a hostile power, and then... Generously offer to marry you. He had my husband murdered, Carolina. I know you're keen on enemies to lovers, but that is not happening. So what's your alternative? I'm going to get married. Wait, what? 
So when you say you're going to get married, I'll get to that in a minute. I see. Caroline, assuming that these two are telling the truth, that means that someone else is running around trying to set me up as my sister's murderer and who knows what else. My children are still in danger. Right. So in order to prevent me from doing things that nearly get the pair of you killed because I jumped to what I don't think was an unreasonable conclusion given the available information, at this point Leo side-eyes Robin and Robin makes a face at him. I need to know what you know. I agree. You do need to know. Good. I'm not going to have them spell it all out in prose right now. Because you don't know. Because it's good to have suspense, and yes, admittedly I have not yet worked out all of the details. But there is one on-the-page question that must be answered. You were working for Baron Mabry a year ago, Captain Collins. Was it you who killed my husband? Leo looks you square in the eyes and shakes his head. No, he says. I didn't kill your husband. Do you know who did? He looks uncomfortable. Are you going to tell me? No. Why not? One crisis at a time, my lady. I see. Right, with that sorted, can we go back to the part where you said you were getting married? Ke Leo. I know you probably don't like me much right now, and I don't blame you. And I realize that this is a little forward, but... Will you marry me? Rosamond, a fake wedding was already the plan. No. I mean... Will you actually marry me? I'm sorry, why are you asking your hot head Leo to marry you? Captain Collins knows the bridge guards, he has the best odds of getting me across and home now. Right, but that doesn't require- Since he's a citizen of Bavoria, marrying him removes any legal grounds for Baron Mabry's challenge to my late husband's will. Following you so far, getting married in Abrinia requires you to have a marriage contract in which we can state that Leo renounces any claim to my estates. He's probably more interested in your tracts of land. Which means that regardless of what happens with the peace talks, my kids still inherit like they're supposed to, which, lest you forget, Caroline, is my entire motivation for everything which has thus far transpired. That's actually very clever. It's only clever if they're telling me the truth right now, but I think if they were here to kill me, they'd already have done it. Fair point. Will you marry me, Leo? Please? Not that I want to interfere, Rosamond, but if you need to marry a Bavorian citizen to sort out this inheritance mess, why not your hot childhood best friend who is also conveniently right here? A. Robin doesn't know the bridge guards. My odds of getting across and home in the next 12 hours are highest if it's Captain Collins and I crossing. Yes, but- B. Robin has sufficient political clout to stay out of trouble on his own. True, but- C. Robin is rich, personable, and attractive. I was under the impression he was already married, but every time I try and think about it, I just get the vague impression of the name Eleanor and a headache. Eleanor! I knew there was someone I had left out of this draft. And D, it is my fault that Leo is wanted by the Abrinian authorities for espionage. I nearly got him killed. Caroline, I owe him whatever protection I can offer, and being married to King Roland's sister-in-law is the best I can do. You'd really marry someone you've known less than a month? Wouldn't be my first political marriage. Besides, we both know that you would have found a way to make this fake wedding into a real one. <clears throat> at least this way I chose it. After staring at you for an uncomfortably long time, yes, this isn't nerve-wracking at all, Leo agrees to your plan for a marriage of political convenience. Thank you. Thank you. And Robin, who has no respect for my outlines either and might also be married, thinks it's a stroke of genius. Robin, I need paper, a pen, a priest, and a second witness, and I need all of them before it starts to get dark. Give me half an hour. What else do you need? Will this fit to you? Good. This one is for you to give to me. Captain Collins gently suggests that you should rest until Robin returns. Why? Because I've seen healthier looking corpses, my lady. A vile accuracy. Captain. Don't worry, he'll keep watch and you'll feel remarkably refreshed when you wake up. Good. Because you'll slide off that tree mid-nap, Leo will feel obliged to catch you and then he won't want to move in case you wake up. Sleep deprivation is a fascinating thing. Robin returns, and once you're changed, he drags the pair of you off to complete the necessary paperwork. That accomplished, you present yourselves to the local priest, and she seems to know Leo. And he really does just speak a Brinian like a native. At some point, sir, we are going to need to have a chat about other things it might be useful for me to know. Regardless, it is time for the ceremony, where you join hands, exchange rings, and promise to love, honour, and cherish the other. And when it concludes, Rosamond, you do know- Yes, Caroline, I am familiar with the wedding service. Congratulations, Captain and Mrs. Leo Collins, you are now husband and wife. And since it is expected, Leo, of course, raises your hand to his face and gently kisses the back of it. Not the trope I was expecting, but I think I can work with it. 
The wedding ceremony has ended, and you and your hot husband are walking towards the tavern nearest the bridge to enact the next part of your plan. I know it's not the done thing for newlyweds to discuss, but if you absolutely can't bear being married to me, you can just divorce me as soon as Edmund comes of age. I won't fight you. Captain Collins wonders why you don't just plan to divorce him when Edmund is of age. But I made you a, a promise. I, would, I wouldn't... So you intended your wedding vows, but did not expect him to mean his. It didn't mean it, like... I'm sorry. I really appreciate you doing this for me, and I don't want to be a burden to you. You're both silent for a moment. But just as Leo opens his mouth to respond, you hear Robin shouting, Who wants a drink to celebrate the happy couple? <sighs> and you're on. The Bridge and Rabbit Tavern is soon chock full of happy patrons whom you are plying with free drinks. <sighs> Once it is full dark and the crowd seems sufficiently rowdy, your new husband picks you up in a bridal carry and, with a little help, gets you both onto the horse. Uh-huh. I mean, you're pretty much just sitting in his lap. Fascinating. As you approach the bridge that will take you home, followed by your well-wishers, you snuggle in closer, hoping that the darkness and the veil will sufficiently hide your face. Just in case. Mm -hmm. When you reach the bridge, some of the guards recognize Leo, and there are many ribald congratulations on his recent nuptials before... Blessedly, they let you across. We're not safe yet. After a tense few minutes, you reach the other side of the bridge, where Leo enjoys a similar conversation with the guards there, before urging the horse forward. I'll just stay here a minute. Rosamond? Rosamond? Well, Captain, I assume you know where you're going. I'll leave you to it. You awaken warm, though somewhat achy, several hours before dawn. I'm on a horse. Correct. I must have fallen asleep. Also correct. I got married. Yes, you did. Can you smell that? You know, this letting the characters run amok thing is actually fascinating. Anyway, after a brief break... Is that code for everyone wishes there was a real toilet, but I guess we'll make do? You walk together beside the horse for the last stretch. Thank you for bringing me home. And I... Is that smoke? As you crest the hill, you see your home before you, mostly obscured by an enormous pillar of smoke and flames. The children. The darkness and the smoke make it difficult to see what's happening, but you scramble down the hill towards your burning home, Captain Collins hot on your heels. Edmund! Charlotte! You skid to a stop as you see Edmund helping with the bucket chain, and after a few more tense moments, you spot Charlotte trying to keep the cats away from the chickens. Thank you. What's that noise? You see one of the fires creeping closer to the stables, and hear shouts from inside. Oh no. The door to the stables has been barred, and men and horses are screaming to be let out. Stop pushing! Stand back! Someone has tied the drawbar in place, but you cut the strap with your knife. Did you have that on you at the wedding? Of course! And strain to lift a heavy piece of wood, but it is very large, and the grooms inside are pushing on the doors, impeding your progress. Come on! Suddenly you feel it start to move. Leo has joined you, and together you lift the bar from the doors, which burst open, knocking you backwards. Your head hits the sun-baked ground, and everything goes black. You wake up in your own bed. I'm either home or dead. Oh, okay, probably not dead. When you exit your chambers, still in your nightgown, you find Leo dozing on a chair outside. I'll just leave him there for now. You seem remarkably sanguine about someone changing your clothes. Maybe the thought of your hot husband peeling off your burned, torn wedding dress isn't so unpleasant? No, I... Wait, did I tell Victoria that she wasn't the boss of me while she was helping me get changed? You're not even slightly disappointed it wasn't him? Leo wouldn't know where I keep my nightgowns. Or the clean menstrual cloths. Oh. It's been a month. I was hoping you would try to kiss Leo while he carried you up the stairs. I didn't. You didn't! But you did pet his manly chest like a puppy and tell him his shirts were very soft. Mm. It was adorable. You know what? None of that matters. Because I'm home. You find your children in the kitchen with your brother-in-law, <laughs> Magnus. Much hugging, crying, and eating ensues. What happened? An arsonist sneaked in last night. Luckily, Charlotte heard the noise and threw her chamber pot at them. Of course she did. The whole household was roused by the racket, but several fires were already burning. But everyone's all right? Everyone is all right. Good. Magnus, when you see Martin, could you ask him to attend Captain Collins and move all of his belongings into the Rose Room? That's your room. Obviously. Rosamond, you know there isn't any ro I mean, you, you don't have contractual obligations. I think you'll find that I do. Caroline, is something wrong? No, I... you... I... I'm not 
not writing that. Is this a hang up about writing intimate scenes where one of the characters has your hot editor's face? Are you afraid he's going to notice? What? No, I... Excuse me. Caroline? So Rosamond married Leo, brought him back to her house, put all of his stuff in her room, and plans to consummate the marriage, and you are... upset? Oh. Was Rosamond right? Is this about the hot editor? That's a separate issue. Look, Leo thinks that Rosamond married him out of guilt. Uh-huh. Rosamond thinks that Leo married her out of duty, or possibly pity. Mm -hmm. And Leo isn't an aristocrat, he's not going to know that they have to consummate the marriage to make it valid. Well, that's gonna be an interesting conversation. That she likely won't bother having, she's just going to assume that he knows. Ooh. Awkward. And even though he's besotted with her and she clearly cares about him, the more I write them, the more I realise that she's just clearly not over Hugo, and they realise it too, and I can't make them talk about their feelings! I see. I want her to be happy! I don't want seduce husband for legal reasons to be an item to check off her to-do list! Caroline, it's not like that's an uncommon trope. I don't care! Every character in this story runs around setting boundaries like I gave them free will or something. Well, this is mine! I'm not writing that! No! And let's fix it. But how do we fix it? What do you need them to do? I need them to talk to each other before things get spicy. Also, someone who isn't Rosamond to explain the facts of life political marriage addition to Leo wouldn't go amiss either. Yeah, but given how much Rosamond needs to do in the house before guests start arriving, the odds of them sitting down to have a deep and meaningful conversation before tonight are low. I know. So we stole him. How? Where's Robin right now? Well, he's... Oh, you're a genius. Thanks. Because he's absolutely tactless enough to bring it up, but also sympathetic enough to explain what's going on when he realises that Leo is clueless. And he can even do a little hurt or and I'll kill you speech. Great. He's also a wanted man. He can sleep in the Rose Room with Leo. It's the most isolated bedroom in the house, which is why Rosamond has been staying there, because it means that her screaming in her sleep doesn't wake up everyone else. Tragic, but helpful. I'll go talk to him right now. You know, I was going to ask about the editor, but one crisis at a time. Sorry for running out like that, I had urgent business. Caroline, are you all right? Perfectly fine, thank you. Did you have a nice day with your children? Yes, I did. Though the, who's that man you brought home with you, mum, conversation was understandably awkward, and then we all ran ourselves ragged trying to fix up the house. Your hot husband pulls you aside after dinner to speak privately. What can I do for you, Captain? Robin has just arrived, and we probably need to keep him out of sight. Oh, we made it. Yes, you're right. If you're happy to stay with the children until the feast is over, he can stay in the Rose Room with me. It's the most out-of-the-way spot, so we're unlikely to be noticed. That does make a lot of sense. The two of you are still very wanted. Is that all right? Of course, my lady. Besides, if he snores too loudly, I'll just smother him with a pillow again. I am going to need the story of why that's an again at some point, sir. Whenever you like, my lady. Caroline, you're sure you're all right? Yes, absolutely. Now go say hello to Robin. You're going to be extremely busy for the next few days and barely get to see him. Can't help but feel like I've missed something. The next few days are given over to preparations for the upcoming Feast of Remembrance and Peace Talks. Yes, so I don't really have time to play dress up right now. I just thought it might cheer you up. Caroline, please focus. We don't know if the arson attempt was the only thing Baron Mabry had planned to disrupt the Peace Talks. We're all still a little on edge here. Mm hmm. Rosamond, have you thought about what you're going to do about Baron Mabry probably being behind your husband's murder and also probably being behind the assassination attempt on your sister? One crisis at a time. Caroline, I can't prove that he had anything to do with Hugo's death and Kat is better guarded than we are. As much as I hate it, we need to get this done first. Everything else will just have to wait. Makes sense. Queen Eudocia and King Roland and their respective retinues arrive two days after you do and immediately shut themselves away. I'll go and speak to them at dinner. Other guests start arriving to stay the night before, but with Edmund and Charlotte running interference, you're able to successfully keep them away from the Rose Room. Good work. The day of your late husband's Feast of Remembrance dawns clear and dry, and more guests start arriving after dawn. Here goes everything. Hugo's Feast of Remembrance begins with the recitation of the appropriate religious offices. Though we perish to darkness and decay, we will rise to light that makes the sun itself seem a mere candle. Let us remember Sir Hugo Hawkehurst, who a year ago today walked into that light. As the feast progresses, both King Roland and Queen Eudocia make a point of thanking you for your hospitality. You're most welcome. And inform you that messengers have already been sent out to spread news of the peace agreement. Fast work, your majesties. It is remarkable what can be accomplished when third parties are not interfering. Isn't it? When the final course has been cleared away, the Queen requests the honour of reading the inheritance lines, and naturally, you would not refuse her. Naturally not. She's just getting to the main event, as it were, when Baron Mabry, who has been looking on with barely concealed disdain, interrupts with... A point of law, your majesty. Here we go. Baron Mabry stands, 
Since Lady Hawkehurst is a foreigner who is married to Sir Hugo under the terms of a previous peace agreement, she is not eligible to administrate until her son's majority. Excuse me. Queen Eudocia looks thoughtful and inquires as to the Baron's proposed solution. Marrying me himself, obviously. The Queen, with the air of someone who has seen a very obvious loophole, asks why the Baron in particular? Why not any other eligible citizen? My lord, I should- Baron Mabry declares himself very taken with you, and your fiery nature your knife-edged incisiveness, your dislike of smoke and mirrors, and your care for your children. He is threatening me in my own house. Rosamond. As generous as your offer is, I fear my new husband would be disinclined to share. There is general consternation. Who is this new husband, Lady Rosamond, and where is he? Well, the doors of the Great Hall open with impeccable timing, and Queen Eudocia smiles as Leo strides in. Good evening, my lord. Baron Mabry demands to know why you just called Captain Collins, formerly a mere soldier in his militia, my lord. Has the Baron met Viscount Collins before? The Baron splutters, and Queen Eudocia explains that since leaving the Baron's employ, formerly Captain Collins and his new wife, Lady Rosamond, have proved such indispensable servants of the Crown that she has seen fit to elevate them to Viscount and Viscountess Collins. So you see, my lord, I am well taken care of, but I do so appreciate your efforts to keep us all on the right side of the law. There being no more objections, Queen Eudocia finishes reading the inheritance lines, and the Feast of Remembrance draws to a close. Finally. King Roland thanks you again and takes his leave. Queen Eudocia thanks you again and congratulates you on your wedding. Thank you, Your Majesty. She risked your lives to deliver the declaration. Bumping you and your new husband up to Viscount and Viscountess was the least she could do. The Baron's not going to be happy that we outrank him now. There will be consequences. And you will deal with them. Let's hope. It's the day after the Feast of Remembrance, just after nightfall, and Robin, the last of your non-royal guests, has departed. You are alone in the gardens. I can't quite believe it all worked out. I was so afraid there would be assassins or poisoner. You did well, Rosamond. I thought that after surviving bandits, a river, an assassination attempt on your sister, a house fire, and a masquerade, perhaps a diplomatic solution was the order of the day? Besides, it gives me something to do in the sequel. Hmm? Nothing. You see two figures ahead of you. Leo? One of them carefully sneaking up behind the other. Leo, look out! You start to run towards your husband and his would-be assassin. Your shout means that Leo has not been caught completely off guard, but he has been knocked to the ground. Get away from him! Skidding up behind them, you draw yet another knife. How many of those do you routinely keep on your person? Clearly not enough! And stab the would-be assassin. He screams in agony and slashes wildly at you as he crumples to the ground, and you see who it is. That's the second bandit. Your screaming has roused the Queen's guard, who immediately take the would-be assassin, formerly known as Bandit Number 2, into custody. Oh. Leo struggles to his feet and rushes over. Are you all right, my lady? I'm fine, but he might not have been alone. Please go check on the children. He frowns, but immediately runs off in the direction of the house. One of the guards helps you to walk the same way. You're bleeding, but it seem like you'll survive. Formal clothing can be surprisingly slash-resistant. Oh. When you get back to the house, Leo is keeping watch outside Edmund and Charlotte's locked room. They are fine, Rosamond. I'm so sorry, Cap- My lord, are you all right? Yes, my lady. Thanks to you. He looks you up and down. Would you like some help? I- Yes, please. You and your hot husband, now armed with water, cloths, and bandages, have made your way to your room, intent on dealing with your mercifully superficial knife wounds. I don't- feel great. I think you might be a little shocky. Oh, you know, I really like this surcoat, and now it's all torn and bloodstained. We'll get you a new one, my lady. Now please, try and stay still. All right on the hip. Am I going to need stitches? If you can rest for the next few days, my lady, I hope not. No more foiling assassins for me. Best avoided, my lady. My name is Rosamond, you know. You can call me Rosamond. I mean, I think we're friends, and... You did marry me. You can probably call me Rosie. I won't mind. I fear I am not in the habit, my lady. Well, Leopold, you, uh, you never will be if you don't start. An excellent point. Rosamond. Better. Oh! You spend most of the next few days in bed recovering from your injuries and your extensive sleep debt. I do feel a lot better. Should I padlock my horse, or will you promise to behave yourself? I promise to refrain from horse theft. If the rest of you promise to stop coddling me and tell me what we're doing to secure the house against further attacks. 
After which we'll get to all of our other problems. You and Leo spend considerable time going over his ideas about the estate and the best ways to keep everyone safe. I'm afraid you haven't married into the safest of families. It has its compensations, my lady. The food is excellent. <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. Let me bring your dinner upstairs, my lady. We should... talk. Yes, about a great many things. Caroline, you're not going to freak out again, are you? No, but now that you mention it, there is something that I need to do, so I'm going to pick this up later. You're sure you're all right? Yes, absolutely. I'll see you soon. Your various aches and pains have improved to the point that you can get out of bed without gasping with pain. Congratulations to me. Your children are delighted to see you at the breakfast table, though apparently they have been taking advantage of your convalescence to pester your hot husband for combat lessons. And how are they shaping up? Leo says they'll be the terror of the playground by the time they return to school. I'd expect nothing less. You look nice. Thank you. Of course, it would be more of a compliment if we didn't have exactly the same. Caroline Lindley, are you going on a date? Maybe. Well, I want you back by 10.30, miss. You have work in the morning. Yes, mother. Actually, I should probably get going now. I don't want to be late. No, I hear he's a real stickler. Turnabout may be fair play, Rosamond Hawkehurst Collins, but nobody likes smug. If you say so. I shoot. So how is your date? Well, we're going out again once I hand over this draft, so I think it went quite well. Great, I'm happy for you. I mean, I am you, so obviously. But how are you going to finish the book? With the feeling of cautious optimism that things are going to be calmer for a while, but also with some obvious sequel bait. I mean, we've still got Baron Mabry and the conspiracy and- No, I mean, what are you gonna do about Rosamond and Leo? Well, like my editor said, it's not like we have to spell everything out. They are married and sleeping in the same room, after all. True. I'll just write them a cute scene or two. Maybe when Rosamond discovers that Leo doesn't actually know most of the formal dances they'll need to perform at the ball they're throwing to celebrate their marriage, and so she has to teach him. Ready? And after that, I think I'll... Leave the nitty-gritty for the fanfic writers. Drop in a few more references to the religion-based magic system in this generally low-magic setting, so it's not such a bombshell in the sequel... I'm sorry, what was that? Nothing. I'm definitely not going to Google that. Rosamond, I need a word. Caroline, it's the middle of the night. What do you want? You may have done something slightly silly. You told Henry, the hot editor, that he and Leo have the same face? Was. You overpromised on your manuscript delivery date and now you're pulling an all-nighter? Was. You insulted your cover artist? No. Then what? I read the fanfiction. Pardon? I read the fanfiction, all right! Shh. I should not have Googled that. But I did, in fact, Google that. You didn't hate most of it, did you? Some of it was amazing, actually, but the thing is, You've got my face. Yes, I know. Oh, Carrie. Did you read the stuff that was clearly tagged as explicit? Mm. Zero sympathy, Caroline. You knew what you were getting into. Now, could you please either go back to sleep or get to work on your revisions? Fine. Mm -hmm. Shh. No. No, it's fine, sweetheart. Go back to sleep. Rosamond, I've had a thought. Hello, Caroline. Haven't seen you in a while. Developmental editing. That would explain the feeling of existential dread. And I've been working. On another story? No, on... work. Fair. But I was watching the coronation and I saw this and I immediately thought of you. Finally found a 4.5 kilogram sword, did you? No, it's only 3.6. Ah, well. Better luck next time. But I do have some ideas about the dress. I woke up this morning wondering if I'd been knocked down by a cart, and also with the uncanny feeling that I was missing something. Really? I subsequently discovered that you have removed not only all references to my male shirt, but also all references to my late husband's sister, Victoria. Yes, that sounds about right. <sighs> Revisions are ongoing then? Yes, but don't worry, I think I know what I'm doing now. Really? Well, I tried using post-it notes to keep track of everything, which was helpful, but they kept getting stuck to my clothes. <laughs> so now I have a spreadsheet. You've colour-coded it, haven't you? Maybe a little. I am not well enough to cope with this. I am going back to bed. A bit under the weather, are we? Yes, I... Wait a minute. Revisions notwithstanding, Rosie. You're in the epilogue now. Anything could happen. Rosamond! What is it now, Caroline? It's about the book cover. But the book doesn't come out until the 5th of February. Yes, but the ebook is up for pre-order, so I decided to get myself an author copy of the paperback and... Well, look. Hmm. That's not what you were expecting. Yes, I know! So I went to Amazon, I looked at the ebook pre-order, and look, it's still got all my notes on it! And who is Jill Bear up? Why is she on my book cover? Uh, well... You see... Who are you? And why do you have my face? Oh, this is going to be good. I can't believe what you've done to it. Yeah, just wait till she reads the back cover. Wait a minute. Yeah, hope you like it. Bye. 
Caroline had turned to writing fanfiction, slotting characters from large movie franchises into coffee shop romances. This had garnered her a small but enthusiastic audience, who had subsequently demanded the stories as actual books. That endeavour had required a number of name changes and the alteration of the more obvious parallels, but it wasn't a great deal more work. Then her fifth coffee shop romance had achieved popularity, or at least popularity on a certain section of social media. This had meant what felt like every single internet denizen suddenly had opinions, which hadn't been great for Caroline's self-esteem. After a particularly well-known commenter had opined, one wonders what C.S. Lindley would do if she didn't have ready-made characters with which to populate her tedious derivative modern romances. Caroline decided she'd had quite enough of people besmirching her abilities, she was going to write something original. She had called her usual editor and told him so, omitting the part where she was about to create an entire work of fiction out of spite. The scene around the captain froze as Caroline inserted herself into his world. Good day, Captain Collins. He said nothing, wondering what she wanted. He hoped it would be less ambiguous than her previous request, which had been, could you maybe smolder a bit more? Now would be an excellent time for an internal monologue from your point of view, Caroline said. Perhaps with a grudging note that your travelling companion is pretty? Captain Collins, who wasn't sure that he had a first name, frowned and continued to say nothing. All right, said Caroline. Maybe Lady Rosamond isn't actually beautiful, but something about her has caught your attention, surely? Her pretty red hair, her intense blue eyes, her adorable... Caroline gestured weakly at her own face. Dimples? he offered. I was going to say freckles, said Caroline, smiling like a shark, but dimples will do nicely. His ears burned. He should have stuck with silence.